Rock check. Do you know where your rock is? Do you have a rock? When was the last time you had a rock? I love rocks. I thought that this was a quirk, a particular passion shared by geoscientists and maybe a few others. Then I had a very bad day, far from home, lonely and homesick in a big city on unfamiliar ground, where I didn't know how to read the history of the few rocks I could find. So I reached out and I asked friends on the internet to show me their rocks. My friends indulged me, and then their friends did, and then their friends, and then several thousand strangers on the internet were showing me photographs and stories of their rocks. I was overwhelmed and thrilled, not just to be surrounded by comforting geology, but to discover so many others shared this passion of mine. My third favorite part of rock checks is getting dragged along with strangers cooing over each other's rocks. My second favorite part of rock checks is how many people treat them as inspiration to go out and acquire a new stone, especially after laments of an abandoned childhood rock collection. But my favorite part of rock checks is finding out the stories of people's rocks. Every rock has a story. Rocks are relentless timekeepers, tracking everything from ice ages to magnetic field orientations to how fast a river flowed. Rocks are also horrendous gossips, eager to share their stories of deep time if we just learn how to listen. Sediments build up in the bottoms of lakes, in annual layers called varves, the geological equivalent of a tree ring that tracks how much rain carried debris down the hills each year. The type and size of crystals in an igneous rock whisper secrets of melt composition and temperature history, growing larger the longer they stay nestled in subterranean warmth. Every fault and fold tells a story of either a brittle failure or ductile deformation in unintuitive evidence that under pressure, rocks are far more fluid than any solid has the right to be. Rocks are a bizarre blend of beloved and disregarded. They play everything from hero to background rock 4,221 in the stories we tell. They dominate our lexicon of metaphors for worthless items, yet like penguins, we trade shiny rocks during our courtship rituals. We eat rocks every day in the form of salt, and we create synthetic minerals in our freezer every time we chill water. Pretty yet durable rocks are used as status symbols for decorating everything from our ears to our kitchens. Through countless mundane interactions, rocks are integral to the stories of our lives. But these stories aren't just what happened before or even what happened to us. They're also lessons in what could happen next. Rocks are a fable made solid, a cautionary tale told in ice cores or landscapes awaiting our interpretation. I have a favorite rock. I have a lot of favorite rocks, really. Both wild rocks that I go and visit and domesticated rocks that I tuck away at home and trade out depending on whose story I need to hear. I have a bumblebee jasper that's my geological equivalent of walking softly while carrying a big stick. Despite its name, it's made of neither bumblebees nor the opaque cord of jasper. Instead, it's made out of blackened fool's gold, acid-sensitive calcite, and deceptively cheerful yellow arsenic blended with sulfur. It's a quiet rock, but one that tells the story of staggering violence, chaos, and eruptions tamed into beauty, formed on the shores of a stratovolcano in Indonesia capable of producing the most violent eruptions on Earth. I adore turbidites, Sheets of ocean floor sediment curling like a cinnamon roll in a hidden underwater landslide. Normally, they're only centimeters big, but in British Columbia, we have one that's bigger than I am. It was captured grain by grain on a sheet of plastic, like a fossil cast, but with a landslide instead of a footprint. It's in a museum preserved decades longer than the original hillside washed away in our endless rain. I go visit it any time I need a reminder that even little things can be big under the right circumstances. 
But the rock that brings me the most hope when I'm feeling too overwhelmed is this rather ordinary piece with red and black stripes called a banded iron formation. It's an extinct rock, a rock whose formation conditions are over and will never occur again. It's that moment of transition that keep them beloved in my collection. Banded iron formations tell the story of the most dramatic and traumatic moment in Earth's climate history. The transition from when we went from a rock with primordial seas and a wispy atmosphere of thin, toxic volcanic gases into a living world rich in oxygen. These delicate layers of shiny black and matte red tell the story that's both a cautionary tale and a glimmer of hope as we face our own climate crisis. Understanding the story of banded iron formations requires backing up to understand stromatolites, blue-green algae that grew as mats in that primordial ocean, wrapping themselves in calcium carbonate, equivalent to how modern coral polyps build out reefs in our modern oceans. 3.5 billion years ago, through photosynthesis, stromatolites took over those early oceans. They breathed in that early atmosphere more akin to a damp Mars than anything we know today. They not only survived the traces of hydrochloric acid, methane, and ammonia, they thrived. More and more and more stromatolites took over those early, shallow, bathtub warm waters. But they weren't just breathing in, they were breathing out. The early oceans were full of stromatolites, pumping out oxygen, saturating those early seas. That's where my beloved banded iron formations come in. Just like rain falls from the sky, sediment and precipitated minerals rain down inside the ocean, falling and creating layers of mud and sludge that capture the history of a particular place and time. During the reign of the stromatolites, that sludge told a history of oxygen reacting with iron to create black layers of iron oxides like magnetites and hematites, switching to red layers of oxygen-rich muddy jaspers when the iron levels were too low. Unlike my beloved bumblebee jasper, this time it's true jaspers, opaque quartz grains hardened into rock. More stromatolites producing more oxygen made these layers of black and red and black and red and black and red, building up into the ocean floor until the iron was all precipitated, the oceans were saturated with oxygen, and this era of rock creation was done. Like everything interesting, this tidy ending holds a little eye of simplification. We found pockets of younger banded iron formations that whisper tantalizing hints of a time when our planet was briefly wrapped in ice, stripping some seas of their oxygen. But these are the exceptions that prove the rule, the epilogue to our story. But the stromatolites didn't stop producing oxygen just because the oceans were saturated. Soon, that oxygen started building up in the atmosphere, triggering the great oxygenation event, which led to the Cambrian explosion of life. Countless creatures took advantage of new, oxygen-rich metabolic pathways. It even changed what minerals could form and how they weathered when exposed at the surface, creating rocks that can't exist anywhere else in our solar system. It was a fundamental shift in our planet's atmosphere, a climate feedback loop of geology, biology, chemistry, and atmospheric science that forever altered the Earth. At least we call it the Great Oxygenation Event. From the stromatolite view, it's the Great Oxygenation Catastrophe. These same changes that created opportunities for new, more complicated life were dramatically different from the circumstances under which stromatolites evolved. A billion years ago, at the end of the banded iron formations and the start of the trilobites, stromatolites nearly vanished from the fossil record. Like before, the exception is what proves the rule. We can still find some modern living stromatolites tucked away in shallow, isolated bays like Shark Bay, Australia, or the beaches of the Bahamas. They look like stone mushrooms an innocuous appearance camouflaging their dramatic role in the shifting of the very nature of life on Earth. But most stromatolites died, poisoned by the very environment they created, leaving behind fossils that are both tribute and warning. I visited these stromatolites once, 
going on a road trip through a blizzard to hunt for them on the side of a country road through a winding forest as the sun set lower on the horizon. I found them in what looked like a road pull-off, except for a solitary understated plaque describing their scientific significance. They were nearly flat rocks, remnants of a puddle that couldn't have been more than ankle deep, now buried so deeply in snow I had to dig to find them. When I brushed the snow off, I could trace my fingers along the countless lines of each mat of algae growing on top of the one before, towards the sun under a sky so foreign we're not even certain it had clouds. That's the story I think of every time I run my chain through my banded iron formation pendant and adorn myself with a piece of Earth's history. That's the story I tell every time someone argues with me about climate change, that the planet will survive. Yes, the planet has undergone more dramatic changes before, but just like stromatolites, just because life finds a way to thrive doesn't mean we will. But this is a story that also brings me hope when I feel bombarded by climate nihilism and when the skies are so thick with smoke that I'm living under a perpetual golden hour and everything feels hopeless. Bend on iron formations are a story of calamity, but also one of transition. They tell me stories of what went wrong before, begging me to learn the lessons that they're holding so that maybe this time we can do better. Unlike stromatolites, humans have the ability to strategize. Through science, we can look at the world around us and understand what will happen next so we can create any future we want. Where stromatolites endlessly pumped oxygen into the oceans and then to the skies until they created an atmosphere so toxic that they could no longer survive their own environment, we have the ability to look around and do better. And that's the power and the fascination of rocks. People are creatures of stories. We learn everything about the world around us from stories. We are born knowing nothing and learn more through stories than we ever could through experience and exploration firsthand. One of the things we learn is how to listen to the stories of rocks. From rocks, we can learn the stories of continents dancing, of oceans splitting, even how our planet was formed. From rocks, we can learn stories of change and understand how to do better, or at least do less harm. Rocks are silent storytellers, but that doesn't make their connection any less deep. Rocks are linked to our curiosity, to our wonder, to our sense of connection to the world around us. Rocks are everywhere lurking in the building stones and the sidewalk gravel of even the densest cities. They're storytellers with billions of years of history to share in every pebble, and they're infinitely patient listeners willing to absorb our worries when we fiddle with a beach stone worn smooth by countless waves. No matter where you are or how long it's been since you last had a rock, another pebble is waiting for you to discover it and listen to its story. I asked before if you had a rock. If not, Maybe it's time to pick one up.